On today's show, we'll follow a young man with autism as he takes an impossible leap, joining a five-week educational program for adults with disabilities and living independently on the flagship campus to help fulfill his dream of becoming a Texas A&M Aggie. We'll also meet Mitra Mehran, an Afghan graduate of the Bush School, and learn how her passion to educate women in Afghanistan turned into a battle for her life and a race to escape the Taliban regime. All that and more on this episode of Around Texas. Everything is bigger in Texas, and the Texas A&M University system is no exception. With 11 universities and eight state agencies, the people of Texas A&M are serving more Texans and making a bigger difference than ever before. These are the educators, researchers, emergency responders, and public servants of the Texas A&M University system. Learn how their work is impacting both Texas and the world. Welcome to Around Texas with Chancellor John Sharp. One of the summer camps that Texas A&M hosts is the Work and College Opportunities Project. It's designed specifically for adults with disabilities. Coordinated in partnership with Texas A&M AgriLife, this unique program provides participants with employment opportunities and instructions in professionalism and self-determination while simultaneously empowering them to live on Texas A&M's campus. My name is Hunter Westbrook. I am from Montgomery, Texas. I'm 18 years old. I am attending Waco camp, which is based in Texas A&M, so I could know what it's like to live on my own without my parents and to be in college. Like so many students with or without disabilities, can only dream of going to a and I'm Luis Castillo, and I'm Program Coordinator for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. I, I had this dream uh, when I started becoming blind and came back to school to A&M to get my bachelor's degree in horticulture and psychology and went to work as a blind visually impaired specialist um, for Department of Rehabilitative Services and thought that it would be great if we could put together a, uh, a program, something that would help individuals that are blind visually impaired to learn uh, independent skills, college skills, how to navigate a college campus, and uh, my field director introduced me to Dr. Cheryl Grimwalch, and we developed Waco Project. Waco, which is an acronym for Work and College Opportunities Program, is a program supporting young adults to experience college and work. It's a program that's held in the summer, a five-week program, and provides the individuals a transitional educational experience from high school into either post-secondary education or um, employment. Originally, Waco was a program that was servicing only individuals with visual impairments or blindness. Since about 2015, I believe, we have served individuals with varying disabilities. They each are assigned a mentor, often a college student with a disability who's attending college here at A&M. A lot of our mentors are Aggies that get to go to class with them, they get to go to the dining halls with them, and they get to go to other activities and they introduce them to the rec center. These mentors, we, we select those that have a passion for working with individual with disabilities. And some of them have disabilities of their own. I learned independence from going through that program and that's what I want these students to learn and that's why I'm here to give back. But I did grow up in that small town and I wanted to know I could do it and learn how to advocate for myself, which throughout the program, it taught me different so now I'm living on my own. Now I'm advocating. 
I give back to other people with disabilities because I struggled a lot, so I want them to know that there's more to life than the struggle. There are some challenges, like learn how to find my way around the college, the college campus, learn how to learn the different bus routes, how to self-medicate. Some of these individuals never spent the night away from home, have never been responsible for their laundry, or which sounds really typical of a lot of our freshmen, that, right? Tough for me to even imagine when I first came to the program, my parents not being there. This was a very big step for him and for us as a family, and my husband was much stronger than I was. <laughs> he would encourage me and would tell me that Hunter needs this because it changes the whole trajectory of Hunter's life. I heard one student say that when they came to Waco, they were so amazed because they finally met people like them. We immersed them in the, in the traditions uh, of A&M, you know, all the sights and sounds and smells of, you know, what A&M tradition is about. That's what we tell them, hey, you know, you're gonna get to come in here and be an Aggie for five weeks, come on, and we'll show you what it's like. Well, it really gives you an opportunity to learn what it's like to be a college student, to have a job. So with the job that Hunter has, he gets a paycheck from the job, which is good. They get paid every Wednesday um, to use as they choose. Of course, you know, we, we try to help them um, balance their budgeting, but this is the first time they are away from their parents, so they have some struggles on that. But Hunter, when he comes back from work, he gives a whole spill on what he did that day at work. Hunter is going to be an Aggie on our two semester hops program. The horticulture department has been wonderful in allowing us to come in and, and utilize our facilities and their lab. The program is modeled after our uh, Hort 301 class, which is garden science, uh, which is uh, for non-horticulture majors. We've tweaked it so that it's uh, for the special needs group and just covers the very basics of horticulture, and the hope is that they become more interested in uh, having plants in their lives. I think that sometimes we think they're not employable, which is the purpose of Waco, and I think that's what caught my attention was this has helped them become more independent living, employable, because I've had some great students come through and they just cannot find any work, and that's what led into the uh, offshoot of Waco, the HOPS program, the Horticulture Options and Plant Sciences is to get them certified so that it makes them more employable, that employers will look, oh, okay, they have a certification in this, so I'll go in and hire them. And it empowers them to become more independent living. You got two? Three. We're very excited and thankful how A&M has just embraced our, our program and, and allowed integration and inclusion for our students with disabilities. As quickly as our world is changing to have individuals with disabilities have the same opportunities as others is very satisfying, but ultimately, that's a and in, in a nutshell, that's a and Like, I always wanted to go to a and but I never thought that I'd ever get the opportunity. I think with this program, I can get used to the feeling of being a college student and even practice, like, life skills. By the end of this program, I wish to help others get the same gift I got. He gets to live instead of being trapped in a, in a world that doesn't care for, for the differences. He gets to be with kids that don't see the differences. They see each other as just their buddies. He's able to bypass the anxiety and fight through those anxieties, and he's able to live, which is huge for him. His life has changed because of this program.
We're here with Dr. Cheryl Greenwells, and she's an associate professor at Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Yeah. Cheryl, thank you for being here. So how does a young person get involved with this program? A young person would apply to the program. We have an application process, an interview process, and then we, we accept them into the program and they are usually here by June 19th or June 20th and they stay with us for five weeks. This is a relationship with Texas A&M. Is that a big boost for the program? It's a big boost. Uh, Texas A&M holds a lot of prestige in the educational world, and um, these students benefit from that. And all of the services that I'm able to access on campus uh, make the program work, including the transportation piece of it. And so these kids come here for five weeks. They stay in Hullabaloo Hall, mm -hmm. and uh, when they finish the program, what's next for most of the students? The students are then supported by their uh, Texas Workforce Vocational Rehab Counselor to move forward in their goal of employment, whatever that is. Will some of them be able to go into a workforce training programs that maybe TEKS runs or something mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. I have been working with Relis Campus and looking at those options um, for them to go into the technical trades uh, like welding or electrical or, or otherwise. So been working with them and, and opening up those programs as well. A lot of it is the students learn how to learn and be responsible for their own learning. I bet it's pretty rewarding to watch these kids light bulbs go off in the middle of this program saying, hey, you know what they said about me is not true. I can do a whole lot more. A whole lot more. And they have the opportunity to audit a blend course in the summer as well. Um, probably about half of them choose to do that. The one thing that too that really supports that independent living, we provide support, not supervision. So the individual um, has the weekend, they stay here over the weekend. So they have the individual, they have the time to make good decisions about what they consider free time. And free time isn't always free time if you've got homework to do. And so it, time management, um, learning how to have a roommate. Probably 60% or more of these individuals that come have never been away from home before. They haven't had the opportunity like a lot of your high school students to go away to church camp or to go away to, they've been very much supervised. Dr. Cheryl Greenwell, thank you very much for what you do for A&M and for the state of Texas. And thank you for being here today. Thank you. Mitra Moran, a graduate of the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M, was working in her home country of Afghanistan when the Taliban returned to power more quickly than anyone could have imagined. So instantly she found herself targeted by the oppressive regime, and all for having the audacity for trying to educate girls. So today we will hear the story of her harrowing escape from Kabul. chaos in Afghanistan as U.S. troops head back into the country to secure Kabul's main airport after thousands flooded the airport in a desperate attempt to flee the Taliban. Transport planes and civilian aircraft from around the world are evacuating vulnerable Afghans. But there's a huge bottleneck at transit hubs. 
I mean, just heartbreaking, tragic scenes, incredible scenes from the airport. Life is hard. I am maybe in the darkest moments of it, seeing people I loved and lived with are, are suffering and enduring um, policies of a tourist group who doesn't have any respect to human dignity. Like thousands of others, Mitra Moran was trapped in Afghanistan. I was born and raised in, um, in northeast of Afghanistan. It's a very open-minded, um, relatively liberal part of um, Afghanistan. I was uh, raised by an uh, educated family with powerful women around me. I had the chance to go to school where I studied political science and public administration. And from there, I, um, I actually started it more of activism through joining clubs. So I think that was, that was where I started to see why I, I need to stand for certain values, why my voice matter. Mitra is a, um, she wants to grow in knowledge all the time. She is not hardwired to a particular position. She can learn. Imagine coming from Afghanistan to Texas A&M as a Fulbright Scholar. What drives you to make that choice? It's, it's wanting to understand a different point of view than your own, and she is that way. The great thing about education in general is that it should never end. And so students who come through the Bush School or through Texas A&M are always Bush School graduates. They're always Aggies. And we owe them something. And so I, I think we have a moral obligation to help where we can. But the situation for Mitra, a graduate of Texas A&M's Bush School, was especially dire since she was being sought by the Taliban and marked for death. So th when the Taliban took over, the Taliban started target killings. And um, I received a letter to that, um, the, on that list, my name was number six on the, on the list to be killed. Uh, Mitra is also someone who'd been very visible in Afghanistan for her outspokenness about women's rights. And so uh, we were very worried about her, obviously. She had been uh, on a hit list before for the Taliban. Uh, it had actually caused her to take actions in the past that, to protect herself. And she had come back to the country and, and gone back to work and was just because she believed so strongly in her country and in the, the place of women in her country. Mitra put her trust in a group of dedicated people from the U.S. and several fearless locals. They would help her avoid and hide from the extremists who sought to hand down a twisted brand of justice upon her. On the U.S. side was Dean Mark Welch, a former Air Force general and the current dean of the Bush School. Also on her side were members of the U.S. intelligence community, special forces operators, and people with connections to top U.S. federal officials. Because the U.S. had officially left Afghanistan, these friends of Mitra had to work in an unofficial capacity to get her past the Taliban checkpoints and onto the U.S.-controlled airfield in Kabul. The first time when we went there, the Taliban were there and we talked and they didn't allow us to get in. They were, um, they were shooting. We couldn't get in. She was in, in, a, in a position where she had no way of getting out on her own. Uh, Taliban checkpoints were established very quickly. The process that she and others have been pursuing through the U.S. Embassy and the country team there to uh, be evacuated had broken down essentially as soon as the embassy had been evacuated to the airport. There was no connection for them now. The process was essentially suspended um, and they didn't know where to turn. Unfortunately, an explosion happened um, two days later and then it killed hundreds of people. Some people came and picked me up from home and they took me through a different gate. Uh, and I'll tell you, at the center of this was a group of Afghans who uh, risked everything to help get her into the airport so that she could get into the processing system and the parolee process to come to the U.S. as a, an Afghan parolee. 
Um, just having the courage on Mitra's part to undertake an attempt to get to the airport is remarkable. And if the first attempt doesn't go well, as hers did not, and you spend literally an entire day trying to make your way through this gauntlet, thinking that every time you come to a checkpoint, they are gonna identify you, and you could literally be killed. Um, it's, I, I can't imagine the courage it took for her to do this. And, and this time with the help of people, of people in the U.S. and from the U.S., she was able to get into the airport and into the processing pipeline. Those same people then came back later and helped her family uh, join her, mother, her father, and her brother. Remarkable, remarkable courage on behalf of everybody involved there. It was very hard in sense of seeing the city you fall in love. You know, go to school, wake up every day to change something. Um, and then you see it's not there anymore. And that was gone. That was not my city anymore. The people I loved was rushing to get out. The misery people were suffering, the innocent children. Um, it was hard. I think that the cost of life, the cost of happiness and freedom, um, world politics is um, operating, and and I and I want to see that change too, because a lot of people um, depend on it. And our freedom and human rights and our values depend on it. So I want, I want that change. If I can do something is helping women and people in Afghanistan to, to, to live with human dignity, which I think Taliban has taken it from them. Uh, and it's remarkable to see someone who's come through the experience that she's come through, not just in the last few months, but over the, the course of her life to see that she still wants to make a contribution, not just to her country or to her gender, but to her world, and never losing sight on the fact that she is here to make a difference. She's stunning. She really is. We're here with General Mark Welch, who's dean of the Bush School here at Texas A&M University, former chief of staff of the Air Force. Welcome. And thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for what you do for this country and for Texas A&M. Oh, it's a privilege. You know, the, the the Aggie loyalty to each other is renowned. And the story about uh, the Bush School and what happened there is just absolutely incredible. Why don't you tell us the story of, of Aggie loyalty? Well, I think it's, it's Aggie loyalty and it's much bigger than that. It's almost American loyalty to Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, uh, Mitra Mekron is a former Bush School student, a, a graduate of the Bush School. Um, she was a Fulbright Scholar from Afghanistan, and after she graduated, she returned to Kabul, and she worked for the Afghan government, and she also worked for Texas A&M as a representative of the Borlaug Institute. She helped administer a U.S. Agency for International Development grant program that provided scholarships to Afghan women uh, to go to universities in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Um, she also happened to be a very outspoken proponent for women's rights in Afghanistan, which, of course, put her on the radar, uh, especially as the Taliban came back into control. She had actually had to leave the country previously because of Taliban interest in some of the things she was saying. And even up to within a couple of weeks of the Taliban takeover, she was being interviewed by CNN and requests for interview from BBC and others to, to continue to tell the story of the empowerment of Afghan women and how critical it was to the development of that country. So she's absolutely fearless. Uh, and then, of course, when the, when the country uh, started to come unglued and um, and the airports became closed, and we tried to help, we, the U.S., tried to help Afghan friends leave the country. Um, Mitra got caught up in all that and ended up getting stuck in the city during the initial stages of that exodus. And a, a group of people came together to help her get out. And those people were Aggies. They were members of various agencies of the U.S. government. Um, they were people who just cared about taking care of someone who obviously bought into what the U.S. had been selling in terms of the future of Afghanistan, and especially the future of women in Afghanistan. And, and some really, really brave Afghans uh, who did the hard work of getting her through Taliban checkpoints uh, after a couple of attempts into the airport, 
uh, and where she was picked up by uh, the State Department and actually got into the parolee pipeline coming to the U.S. And Mitra also managed to get her mother and her father and her brother out with her. Uh, she has a sister who was out earlier, and she is now in Washington, D.C. She's been working out at the Bush School in D.C., but recently left us to pursue other employment there. Um, and she is just a remarkable, remarkable example of a citizen of the world who will make a difference, either in her country again someday or in ours, uh, or um, which is now her new adopted country, or in major international organizations, because she's brilliant, she's talented, she's courageous, she's just wonderful. So what do you think Mitra's uh, future is? Mitra will make a difference, <laughs> whatever she ends up doing. She is scared of nothing. Uh, she wants to take on the big issues in the world. How do nations communicate? How do women thrive? How do families prosper? How do citizens get opportunity? And she'll do that. I'm not sure what organization she'll end up with, but she is passionate to uh, an unbelievable level about those kind of issues. And she's not intimidated by any person or any challenge. Uh, and so she's a voice that we're going to hear again. General Welsh, thank you for what you do for this country and what you have done for this country, and thank you for what you do for Texas A&M. All right, back at you, sir. Thanks, thanks for being thanks here. Thanks for taking care of us all. My name is Red Stegall. I'm a 1960 graduate of West Texas A&M University. I uh, have a degree in animal science, and I'm a country singer, a poet, and a cowboy. My goal when I was little I wanted to be a veterinarian. When I was 15, I lost my left shoulder to polio, and I realized then that I, I couldn't do that anymore. So I got a degree in animal science. Stay as close to it as I could without being able to accomplish my dream. After graduation, I wanted to be in show business. I went to Hollywood. I had written a song that I got Ray Charles to record called Here We Go Again. So people started paying attention to my songs. I had three number one country records, and the rest of it has uh, been a climb, but it's been a blessing. Several years ago, I got to thinking, you know, you've always loved music. Why did you get a degree in, in agriculture? The audience that I'm performing to and have performed to for over 50 years are people in the agricultural societies. I love to hear about people and what they've done and what they've accomplished, and I love every minute of it. My time at West Texas A&M were three of the most productive years of my life. And really proud of all the strides they've made and the way they've improved their vision of agriculture on the high plains. That's it for this week's show. We'll see you next week on Around Texas.